Good morning, everyone. This is day two of our uh, prepare workshop on data access, creation, and maintenance. So we are on the third session, which is on clinical and epidemiological data. We have two very renowned speakers. Um, uh, each will speak for about 20 minutes. And after, uh, and you can ask questions at any point via the live chat or tweet at NSF underscore prepare. So the first speaker is Dr. Matt Biggerstaff from CDC. So Dr. Matt Biggerstaff has been with CDC since 2006 and an epidemiologist with the influenza division since 2009. In this role, he leads CDC influenza forecasting and modeling activities and works to understand and evaluate how forecasting and mathematical modeling can complement influenza surveillance and inform seasonal and pandemic influenza public health actions. He has also led and supported CDC's and US government's interagency modeling and forecasting response to the COVID-19 pandemic since January 2020. So today he'll be speaking about improving pandemic response, employing mathematical modeling to confront COVID-19. So with that, I ask Matt to lead the discussion, lead the talk. Good morning uh, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining and thank you to the organizers for giving me some time uh, to discuss uh, our work uh, at CDC. And uh, given the sort of uh, framing of this conference with sort of how data can improve uh, public health preparedness, I uh, will be talking through a couple of examples of how sort of the open sharing of both public health data and modeling and forecasting results has really enabled uh, and advanced uh, the, the science of forecasting and, and the use uh, of uh, modeling outputs uh, during COVID-19. So a lot of the work I'll be showing you is how this is all done uh, out in the open and is accessible uh, to the, the public and, and others uh, for, for uh, future research. So hopefully my slides are coming through now, uh, but just if people haven't really um, seen this year, I think modeling has really, uh, become really integral uh, to the response to COVID-19. It has definitely been used in other public health emergencies and uh, kind of seasonal uh, activities uh, throughout uh, the, the last decade at CDC, but it has really, I think, uh, been accelerated by this pandemic and is likely, I think, to probably change uh, the, the use of modeling across the agency uh, going forward. And uh, it really serves many roles in the response, given the time I won't be going through all of the roles it's, it's done. And I'm gonna be focusing on sort of our efforts to help think about the spread and trajectory uh, in the US, specifically the, the forecasting work and, and long range projection work uh, that's been going on. So moving into forecasting, uh, this is a collaboration that we do with multiple uh, groups. This is building on work uh, that was done uh, in influenza and vector-borne diseases uh, since uh, the 2013, 14 flu season uh, and really uh, is a way we want to collaborate and engage with multiple academic and private industry groups to really enable those sort of short-term uh, forecasts of the pandemic. As we're thinking about what we uh, want to forecast uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we always start with what data is available and what data actually can help uh, us sort of uh, prepare and respond to the pandemic. And so this uh, enables sort of uh, the sort of data availability and it's sort of um, utility to the response is the first sort of question we have uh, as we're sort of thinking about what targets uh, we're gonna uh, work with our academic partners to forecast. And so you'll see the list here of sort of total reported deaths per week at the national and state level, newly reported deaths per week at the national and state level, daily new hospitalizations per day at the national and state level, and the newly reported cases per week at the national, state, and county level. And these uh, targets all didn't turn on, you know, right as we started this work uh, in April of 2020, but they were sort of uh, kind of came on sequentially as sort of the data sources became more stable, became better understood uh, as new data sources were sort of stood up like the hospitalization data. And so it really is an iterative process where we're sort of uh, always working across the response to understand what data is now available and what's being used to really tell the story of the pandemic and used to drive decisions uh, about resources. So this is uh, always a partnership and also our work through these multiple academic groups often helps 
uh, sort of identify sort of the areas where further kind of uh, analysis of data needs to be done if we're seeing, uh, you know, reporting uh, issues happen or if there are other sorts of um, uh, kind of uh, bumps that, that happen in these data sources, they're often identified through these partnerships. And everything we're doing in the space is always uh, publicly available data, and it does help us sort of advocate for the release of data to help enable uh, forecasting efforts. And so the way we do this is uh, we bring all of these uh, forecasts in and then we work uh, to uh, ensemble them or combine these forecasts together in real time. And we're also making sure we put everything out uh, in sort of other uh, kind of formats. So uh, the kind of community can see both the individual forecasts that are coming in, the ensemble, how well those uh, perform uh, compared to what was observed. And I'll be walking through uh, some of the open source tools and open availability of these data. So just going through, if you're wondering what the forecasts are saying this week and really how we've used them over the response, if we're thinking about our case uh, forecast, um, as, uh, if we're looking now on the horizon of about four weeks, uh, so that would put us at the week ending June 5th, uh, you see all of the individual forecasts coming in on the left. So each of those colors is a group uh, that's really making these forecasts for us and working with us. And then you see the ensemble on the right uh, with those sort of individual forecasts overlaid again in gray. Uh, the uh, on, uh, uncertainty kind of envelope uh, is in the red. So the 95% uh, prediction interval is the light red. The 50% prediction interval is in the dark red. And so what that really means is 95% of the time those observations should uh, be in the light red uh, kind of cone of uncertainty. And 50% of the time they should be in the dark red. A cone of uncertainty. And you can see over this period a very kind of strong uh, kind of indication of the ensemble of decline, uh, which is positive news. Uh, and by the end of this horizon, we could be seeing around 85,000 to about 400,000 new cases reported uh, this week. We also do this, as I mentioned, by the state level, and we're uh, seeing forecasts that are likely to decrease in 34 jurisdictions, and that's up from 27 last week. We do get more than point forecast as you're able to see sort of the uncertainty here. And we use that sort of probability to translate uh, these forecasts into likely decreases or increases using a threshold of a 75% chance of increase or decrease to make those statements. So it's a way we're translating the probability of these forecasts as well uh, into, into sort of the what might happen going forward. Moving to the hospitalization uh, data, this is coming from the system that was stood up by uh, HHS uh, in sort of the late uh, summer. And this really does give us a great uh, awareness of what hospitalizations look like each day. And once these data came online, this really enabled the sort of hospitalization system. Uh, prior to that, there was no gold standard source of hospitalization data. And once uh, this system turned on and really got uh, you know, most, uh, if not uh, almost all hospitals reporting to it each day, that enabled sort of the, this uh, being class, you know, used as, as the target and then uh, kind of creation of the ensemble. Like the cases, uh, we see a strong indication of decline in the ensemble with a likely decrease nationally with the potential to be under a thousand hospital admissions per day on June uh, 7th, uh, which would be quite a uh, positive thing uh, given where we've been in the at this pandemic and you can see sort of the observed daily data has been bouncing between sort of 4,000 and 6,000 since March. Um, and that these are likely to decrease in 32 jurisdictions uh, over this period and that's up from 26 and no uh, jurisdictions are likely to increase. Moving to deaths, just to put these two targets together, we still are getting multiple individual uh, forecasts here, but you can see the ensemble uh, indicating the again a likely decrease nationally with about 1500 to 6000 new deaths reported the week ending June 5th um, and forecast to decrease in 15 jurisdictions uh, with the potential to have about 590,000 to 600,000 uh, total deaths reported by June 5th so unfortunately we may be in that sort of potential of breaching the 600,000 death uh, mark in the United States uh, by the end of this uh, period. Um, so this is just was to kind of give you a flavor of how some of these forecasts are translated, but often you're probably wondering if what the public is going to do, they're probably not going to set and kind of think through this. And so we do work to put these out uh, nationally through uh, Twitter um, each week to kind of get engagement there and to also highlight some of the tools and availability of these uh, data sources on interactive platforms so people can go and look uh, at their state forecasts or their county forecasts 
uh, as well if they're thinking about cases. And this has gone out weekly uh, on Twitter since um, uh, about May. So this is sort of, I think, uh, one way that CDC pushes these forecasts out uh, and tries to raise the awareness of these tools being available. We also know that people want to kind of know how these forecasts are made. And so part of this uh, is sort of collecting the metadata of the forecast, right? Because forecasting a pandemic is difficult. I'll sort of highlight some of the accuracy assessments uh, in a few slides, but uh, this is one of the first questions we get as we're sort of talking to decision makers at CDC, we're talking with our state and local partners, uh, is really what are the different uh, assumptions going into this about how maybe social distancing is gonna change in the future. Uh, and so we work to sort of collate uh, the data that's used uh, by these uh, uh, forecasts, uh, what assumptions they're making, what methods they're using, uh, and putting that out in a sort of at least easier to read format uh, for the public uh, as a way to kind of understand uh, these methods. Uh, we also uh, work with partners at the University of Massachusetts to really make sure that these data are available uh, for use uh, by the community at large. And so they've created a, a kind of a, an application called Zoltar that really facilitates the storage, uh, evaluation, and visualization of forecast. And so you can go and ping uh, this archive and really look at uh, forecasts for COVID, uh, for other forecasting projects like flu. Uh, and this really does, uh, is really trying to enable the sort of utility and collaboration with these data to improve the overall science uh, of forecasting and to make sure uh, these uh, forecasts are transparently uh, available and understood uh, how they're being uh, uh, ensembled and assembled here. Uh, these sorts of uh, repositories allow sort of the on-demand comparison of forecasts with reported data. So this is on the CDC COVID Data Tracker uh, website. So if you haven't gone to COVID Data Tracker, there's a wealth of uh, data available there from across the response, uh, including these forecasts, case data, vaccination data, uh, serology data. Um, uh, there's just more and more added every week. Uh, so it really has enabled and is a resource we highlight to the forecasting and modeling groups on uh, every call because there is a lot of information that can go uh, from that site that can be used to help uh, with model validation or calibration or um, parameterization there. But uh, what we're going to focus on with forecasts is that this sort of allows any member of the public to sort of see uh, the ensemble plus any of the individual forecasts. Right now I'm just highlighting the ensemble, uh, what they're saying going forward. So this is pulled from uh, the website to date, it hasn't been quite updated with forecasts we got uh, this week, um, but you can see what the forecasts are saying at the national level. You can do this by state, by county, uh, and then you can also go backwards for any time uh, since this uh, the forecast started. So really a, quite a long time series uh, of what uh, you can go back and really see how the ensemble or the individual forecasts were doing uh, with what was compared. So we're trying to make sure that there's an easily sort of accessible uh, record uh, by the public to really understand what these forecasts are saying and how they do, since that's uh, really one of the main questions people have. Uh, we also have worked uh, with partners at Carnegie Mellon uh, to make uh, on-demand evaluation of forecast uh, accuracy, and they partnered, I believe, with Google on this as well. So you can go and look. Here you can see the sort of what variables are being, uh, uh, what targets there are for the forecast, like incident deaths, incident cases, what different scoring metrics you might want to think about. So the weighted interval score is sort of uh, thinking about uh, like mean absolute error, but accounting for the uncertainty that these forecasts are providing. Uh, you can look at absolute error, you can look at coverage, which is really how often the observations are fitting in those prediction uh, intervals. Like I mentioned earlier, you'd want 50% to be available, 50% uh, of observations to be in your 50%, but you can really look at this for any of the forecasts that are available. You can look at the different horizons since we get one, two, three, and four week ahead. You can look at the US, different states. So this is really enabling a pretty robust uh, evaluation by people who want to use these forecasts at different geographies. And you can really look at this uh, anytime you want and can see how sort of the impact of the actual pandemic activities, you can see sort of the observed uh, deaths here on the bottom and how that might be impacting sort of the accuracy of the forecast uh, over time. And we do see sort of differences in accuracy performance when we're sort of near uh, periods of transition. Uh, and so this allows you to really explore and interrogate the data in a pretty intuitive and, and friendly way, which hopefully enables sort of more trust uh, in uh, forecast uh, by, by users. 
Uh, having all of these data available also allows us to assess the ensemble and make sure sort of uh, that what we're using as sort of the main CDC message from forecast really is uh, a robust uh, kind of forecast and uh, you know that that it's performing as expected. And so we've been working uh, over the pandemic to not only have tools like I just showed, but also sort of more scientific um, assessments of these uh, products. And so this is just showing a preprint uh, that we put out uh, last August on sort of the assessment of the ensemble performance, look, looking at sort of national uh, different states. And this is looking at sort of the 95% uh, prediction intervals with observations by different, uh, by US different geographies. And then also looking at that coverage, as I've talked about to see if our coverage estimates were matching uh, what we would expect. And so you can see, uh, we also use this paper to sort of uh, uh, update how we were making uh, ensembles based on the performance with what we had been using previously in the pandemic here in the top uh, with how we changed it and how those compared. You can see uh, previously the coverage was a little uh, low for 95%, uh, but the new method improved that coverage up and having sort of a repository of the forecast made in, in real time and archive so we know that's what was available then really enables sort of going backwards and, and trying different methods and knowing that those methods would have performed that way uh, had we used them in real time, since we're not really uh, having to change or get new forecasts uh, to do that. Uh, we've also, uh, has been seen in uh, kind of flu and, and vector borne previously, but we've evaluated sort of the ability to, by bringing all of these forecasts together and actually having them make the same targets uh, use the same format, submit to the same repository, this uh, ability to make ensembles is actually more accurate than individual models. So not only having sort of these uh, uh, kind of data available to just uh, compare sort of the differences in models, but this really actually makes forecasting more accurate doing it in this sort of framework. And so the gray lines are the average weighted interval scores for the individual models across all 50 states. And so a lower uh, average uh, weighted interval score is better. So you want to be towards the bottom of this graphic. You can look at this uh, over time here on the, the right with the one week ahead target. Um, and then the blue lines are the uh, kind of average uh, weighted interval score for all models. And the red lines are for the ensemble. Uh, and so you can see the red line is always uh, below the blue, uh, kind of over this period by uh, target. Uh, and then you can see that there's a baseline here as well. Uh, to kind of say, well, our forecast improving on sort of uh, just what we might know by looking at the data themselves uh, and not really uh, trying to make a prediction. And you can see it's also below uh, that uh, gr uh, green line as well. And you can see some of the differences as I was talking about over the period of the pandemic where forecasts do uh, often perform uh, less well when we're nearing a, a peak. And so you can see the weighted interval scores increasing uh, over time there. And this is also in a, a preprint at the bottom here as well. Uh, having these data also allows us to sort of evaluate, um, I've been highlighting an NCDC focus on the four week horizon, but we always get questions about sort of, well, how much farther can we go out in time? So can you go eight weeks, 16 weeks? Uh, and, and so groups are also submitting forecasts for those different targets and having them all sort of together allows us to evaluate those and continue to sort of provide evidence on what is a reliable sort of horizon for forecasting. And so you can see uh, the kind of horizon here in, in uh, the different lines with the yellow being a one week horizon. And as the colors get darker, those horizons are sort of getting longer up to about 20 weeks for this darkest uh, color. Again, we're looking at the weighted interval score. So lower is better. And you can see weighted interval scores are, are lower uh, for the shorter horizons. And they really increase uh, as you go longer and, and kind of get quite high um, as you're getting into these long um, periods. And this also looks at sort of coverage on the bottom. So how well did the forecasts uh, kind of match their uh, prediction intervals? And you can see these long horizon forecasts often do not really match uh, their uncertainty bounds at all. And we're getting 95% prediction intervals that are uh, well below 50% for these. And so this continues to sort of allow us to provide evidence on when our forecasts quite uh, kind of actionable and when we might uh, view them with a little more uncertainty about uh, long-term planning. And then just as I've sort of highlighted with an earlier preprint, uh, having an archive of what we know was available uh, as of that date allows us to really go back and think, well, can we be creating this ensemble better? Right now, you know, the ensemble 
uh, is one of the top performing models, but we know it's not perfect, right? You saw sort of weighted interval scores increasing over certain periods. Uh, coverage is not always where we want them to be. Uh, and so this uh, allows us to try different approaches. And this is work really being led by the University of Massachusetts and Carnegie Mellon in collaboration with us. But uh, this really allows us to try different approaches and see how well they perform uh, in periods of the pandemic when we know uh, forecasting is more difficult, like at peaks. And so this is just looking at sort of different uh, approaches uh, over time. And you can see if we're looking at cases and deaths, how well different ensembles uh, are doing. And this is uh, something we've been working and evaluating on uh, since the, the pandemic to make sure the efforts that we use to create ensembles really are robust and that there is a, a track record and sort of a rationale for the approaches that are being taken are, are not taken. And again, this is um, put out uh, in late, uh, in early April here of this year, but this was an update to sort of a, a work that had been done in 2020 as well to try to make sure that this information and data used uh, is out in the public uh, to help there. Uh, as I've sort of highlighted, we you know think there is sort of a, a period when uh, forecasting, which is really trying to say what will happen when there's a horizon where there may be uh, not as actionable. And so I did want to highlight sort of another effort on long range planning scenarios to really try to take us a few months uh, or uh, into the future of maybe that three to six month period when it really does help uh, with some planning and thinking through what might happen if policies change or if we're able to get vaccine in arms faster. And again, this is done in an open kind of data framework uh, with groups really thinking through together what uh, should we be projecting going forward, what data should be used as sort of the uh, data to calibrate, what common assumptions should we be using and how do we sort of describe those in a framework that makes sense? Uh, and then how do we submit and ensemble these projections together? So you can see a list of kind of participating um, uh, groups here. This is again, a multidisciplinary and multi-group uh, approach. And I'll just walk through a couple of uh, scenarios, uh, the kind of last round of scenarios that were put out uh, by this group that we then were able to put into a, a more, an MMWR from CDC uh, to really highlight what might happen to the pandemic over the next few months and really how our actions uh, with the use of non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, and vaccinations can really impact uh, that. And so this is coming from round four. There uh, was done in, in late March. And we really wanted to focus this scenario on sort of the interacting effects of non-pharmaceutical intervention use uh, and vaccination. And so uh, really how could uh, NPIs, their change in the intensity of those NPIs uh, be impacted with uh, different levels of vaccine. And this also included B117, uh, which was one of the many variants uh, causing us a bit of stress uh, in the US and around the world. Uh, but just to kind of understand how a uh, variant with increased transmissibility uh, might uh, also impact these results. And so we had six uh, modeling team submit projections to be included uh, in the ensemble. Uh, I won't go through all of the different um, assumptions that are going in, but these multi-model Comparisons are really fantastic, but they do take sort of a lot of work to really make sure we're aligning sort of assumptions across groups to the point where you're not sort of removing all uh, kind of variability, but you can at least interpret broadly what the different models are, are looking at and that they're in the, sort of the same neighborhood uh, with these assumptions that helps sort of level the playing field and, and is sort of a, a data source needed uh, for these things um, uh, to kind of make them more useful. Uh, for public health, but you can kind of uh, see quickly, you know, this, the top scenarios had higher vaccination, um, the lower uh, scenarios had lower vaccination, and then NPI use uh, varied and was based on sort of observed uh, NPI use in March. However, the models had estimated that it's sort of then reducing that going forward. Uh, and again, this allows you to sort of see the different models and how they look uh, over the period. You can see there's quite a lot of model variability like we see in forecast. We've seen this in every sort of a project where we've ever done model comparison is that different groups all making really um, smart uh, models and smart assumptions will have different paths going forward. And this sort of uncertainty is true uncertainty, right? So we want to try to capture this and not rely too much on one model for these sort of uh, questions where there is just sort of an unknown quantity of that. So you can see the different models, the ensemble, by having them in this sort of common framework, you're easily able to compare uh, the results uh, and findings of these, which otherwise, I mean, many of you were probably uh, quite aware of the different scenarios coming out in the pandemic, 
uh, in early 2020, and it was impossible to really compare sort of what the trajectories look like, really the overall impact without just sort of opening multiple uh, PDFs and just uh, kind of doing it by hand. And so these sort of open data calibration, uh, collaborations and, and frameworks really make uh, sort of the results uh, much more actionable and uh, easier to communicate in public health. I highlighted this sort of uh, MMWR came out, but I think this was quite a, a huge uh, leap <laughs> for uh, CDC and, and for the community, right, to have a set of scenario projections uh, put out in an MMWR. Uh, and really used to guide sort of the usefulness of, of sort of increasing vaccination and maintaining uh, the use of uh, NPIs uh, in this sort of critical stage of the pandemic as we're really working to get those vaccination levels uh, quite high. So I think it highlights the, the kind of the usability of sharing data rapidly by academic groups, uh, the collaboration with academic groups and the government. Um, I think a lot of this open data sharing enables uh, these sorts of activities pretty rapidly. You see this came out in May 5th. Uh, these results were sort of based on March 27th. And while a month may not seem rapid uh, for non-government people, getting this sort of together uh, in that time uh, was is quite a feat. And this is just showing sort of some of the results uh, from these models, but with the sort of data that was treated as sort of the gold standard for these scenarios, the different uh, ones I walked through with the uncertainty intervals. Um, uh, kind of highlighted uh, and then sort of what the top line uh, messages were uh, with the main one that was sort of used that shark declines could begin in, in July, uh, but we're going to get uh, those shark declines faster with the high vaccination scenarios and so really making sure efforts to maintain that vaccine coverage are really uh, critical for the stage of the pandemic we're in as we're seeing sort of uh, the uptake in vaccination decline a bit uh, compared to where we were a, a month ago. So that was a really quick uh, kind of overview, but I think uh, hopefully people uh, understand really how modeling has been critical to the COVID-19 response and CDC is utilizing uh, a lot of data to inform public health decision-making. Uh, and really it does help improve situational awareness. We're able to synthesize a lot of uh, data together uh, and it really is an informing the evidence base uh, for our mitigation strategies. So thanks uh, for so uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bigastaff, for your um, your talk. And if uh, there are questions, please type them on live chat or tweet at NSF underscore prepare. We'll take the questions after both the talks have been concluded. So our uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Nathaniel Hoopert from Wild Cornell Medicine. Uh, Dr. Hooper is a physician and researcher at Wild Cornell Medical College and Cornell University, whose work has focused on public health emergency response logistics, including the COVID-19 pandemic. He currently serves as the translation and policy lead for the Oxford and Cornell-based COVID-19 International Modeling Consortium. He served for 10 years as senior medical advisor in the US Centers for Disease Control, Division of Preparedness and Emergent Infections, and was also both a medical advisor for the US Hospital Preparedness Program and member of the Scientific Advisory Board of the US National Institute of Health's Modeling of Infectious Disease Agent Study. He practices internal medicine as a hospitalist, hospitalist at New York City's Lower Manhattan Hospital and trained at the University of Pittsburgh and Harvard Medical School. So today he's uh, going to give a talk on COVID-19 data requirements for clinical and logistical modeling. With that, the floor is yours, Dr. Hubert. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. Uh, I really appreciate the, the kind introduction and uh, also the opportunity to uh, be with my old colleague, uh, Matt, and, uh, and all of you. I'm gonna share my screen now. Um, and here we go. I'm... Uh, going to speak about some things that are different than what Matt spoke about, uh, but I do want to acknowledge the tremendous uh, gains that have, uh, that have come uh, for modeling and, and the use of modeling over the last decade. Um, a historical point is that I was actually asked to assist uh, the CDC in creating its first preparedness modeling unit, uh, and that was only back in 2008. So the, the strides that have been made are, are truly great. Um, I 
uh, though, am going to talk about what happens under the hood of these models much more because that's, that's where I live uh, for the most part as a modeler. Uh, I'll, I'll leave the model translation bit a little bit to, uh, uh, to the end of the talk. I received a, uh, so we, we were confronting the outbreak of COVID in February. Uh, certainly we knew about it in, in January. We were confronting it in February. We were sure that we had cases in New York. And then at the beginning of March, uh, things really uh, reached a, a critical point. And um, I was in co contact with multiple modelers uh, across uh, the country and across the globe. And one of them from the United States wrote me this email on March 21st. Uh, and I'll read it. I appreciate the need to prioritize patient care in general and testing for healthcare workers in particular. And this was in response, I should say, to um, reports that I was getting from uh, the New York City Department of Health that uh, there was no ability to do uh, serological surveys uh, because all of the resources were being devoted to uh, testing um, actual uh, clinical cases. The email goes on, but in your conversations with planners, please advise them that testing is needed not only for detection and isolation of cases, but also for understanding the prevalence of asymptomatic infection and transmitted. Without it, models are flying blind. And that last sentence is one that I've used multiple times in the last year to explain the importance of some of the uh, topics that I'll be talking about in just a second. Um, just as a, as a humorous aside, there's a, an analogy to this in uh, the second to last, I guess the last Harry Potter movie, uh, where Neville says, right then, so what's the plan, Harry? And Harry says, okay, there's something we need to find somewhere hidden in the castle, and it may help us uh, in what we're trying to do. And Neville says, right, where is it? And Harry says, we don't know. And Dean Thomas says, um, Oh, sorry, Neville says, what is it? We don't know. Dean Thomas says, where is it? We don't know that either. I realize that's not much to go on. And then Seamus says, that's nothing to go on. And certainly at the beginning of COVID, we as modelers felt that we had nothing to go on. And when you're faced with uh, the, the policymakers asking you, where is this going? And having some skills, it's very tempting to uh, overextend and to overcall your ability to say what will and won't happen. And it's really critical at times like that to recall what very experienced users of modelers uh, say about modeling in general. So one of them is my senior engineering colleague from Cornell, uh, Jack Muckstadt, who's had a 50 year career making um, logistical models for industry. Uh, three, things that he says about models, I think are really instructive here. One is that the purpose of the model in situations like this is to understand the problem. Uh, second is that models can tell you the consequences of doing or not doing things. And third is that models in this setting are instructive and not prescriptive. And as a joke, uh, but with some real um, uh, you know, experience underlying this, he says, you, you can't learn anything while your mouth is open. And, and you know, we've seen something like 300,000 papers written on COVID in, in the last year. And, and I think that there's a, there's a jump to wanting to put something out when in fact, it might be better to work with the people in charge uh, first, and then think about whether or not uh, the thing that you've created with your model needs to be published. Um, so it's just a bit of a cautionary tale. In addition, I would say, as you can see from this slide, there are many sciences in which modeling uh, can be useful for predicting and preparing for public health emergencies. It's not all simply infectious disease uh, dynamical models. Um, so this is what we were confronted with. Uh, you can see the date of this screenshot from the actual slide that I produced on March 10th, 2020. We had some data from China. We had some data from Italy, and we had a little data from the United States. Here on March 12th, we had 389 cases. And so you, we were able to put that together, as many others were, to make some simple graphics. And we could see that the US was uh, seeming to follow Italy, which was seeming to follow uh, the, the outbreak in Wuhan. And you know, with a little bit of math, you can say, well, this sort of looks like a gamma distribution or some other type of distribution. And then with a little bit of creativity, you can say, well, maybe it looks like that, or maybe it's gonna be slower or flatter or more peaked. Um, and what we did was because Matt and his colleagues at CDC uh, really jumped on the ball and created a brief series of modeling 
guidance documents uh, that had actual quantitative um, uh, 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 um, uh, templates for how to make some of the initial uh, models, we were able to produce, and you can see this was March 11th, a very simple Excel-based, you know, spreadsheet-based calculator that went from a population to a symptomatic attack rate uh, and an asymptomatic attack rate uh, with huge variability. And we, we had no idea what the final numbers were going to look like um, with some data from CDC about how we might be seeing uh, the age-based distribution of hospitalization and critical care use. Uh, and we were able to take that and produce some outputs. Uh, and this was you know, really a, before New York City even had an outbreak. We were able to say, this is what the outbreak might look like. Uh, and then we added a little bit of uh, a simulation with my colleagues uh, from, uh, from Cornell and, and from uh, actually from uh, tech, uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design, that's Peter Jackson, and produce some estimates of what the uh, hospital census might look like in New York City on the basis of some of these parameters uh, and produce some quantitative output that in this case, for example, for a severe um, outbreak would see a, a peak occupancy of 8,800 uh, on, on day 32. You know, many, many assumptions going in here. It turns out at the end of the day, when we actually get information from the city and from the state, that these uh, were not completely unreasonable estimates. And so it, it just shows that very basic modeling without any uh, sophisticated mathematics can actually uh, uh, you know, give planners some reasonable um, framework for thinking about what might be ahead. I'll point out a couple of interesting things here. One is that in the dark blue, it's the New York City data. In the black, it's the New York State data. And you can see that they're very similar in terms of death accounting, but very different in terms of admission counting. And so this is because New York City was using a different set of criteria for understanding what a COVID hospitalization was. And this difference of about 50% persists across the entire outbreak. Uh, and, and so this just gives you a sense of how things that would seem simple to an outsider, uh, like, is this a COVID hospitalization, may not be so simple. The other thing that I'd point out is that the census uh, that we predicted with this very simple model uh, went up and went down, but the census in real life actually uh, had this huge lag. And that's critical for understanding how health systems are going to cope with a crisis like this. Uh, and so it, it just calls for uh, more sophisticated modeling. But at the end of the day, the final version of this model, which we really stopped working on in around April, required these pieces of information to make a, a even somewhat accurate estimate of hospital utilization. It requires an understanding of the population and the age structure of the population. So we were going back to the census and, and to the American Community Survey quite a bit. A, an attack rate, so the proportion of people in a given area who will become infected. And that's, of course, an unknown at the beginning of something like this. An asymptomatic rate. So you want to know what fraction of those people will actually go seek care. Um, the hospitalization rates by age, because some of the um, breakdowns are, are figuring out what group in which age category will be using different parts of the hospital and healthcare system. And then critical care use um, by, uh, by age, and then patterns of utilization, which is really different than are they going to the ICU or not. So this, for example, is if they come from the emergency department and they go to a medical re a regular medical ward, will they then wind up going to the ICU? And if they get better in the ICU, will they then come back to the re regular medical ward? I believe that, that the, the, the transitions um, in side the hospital by location uh, that were unaccounted for by the simple models are what uh, we would need to uh, input into the model to get the proper distribution of the length of stay. And then of course, quantitative estimates of length of stay by outcome and location and then fatality rates by age and location. So 
it, even for simple models like this, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of information. Where do we get that information? Well, New York City, I think, was one of the leaders in the world for producing and publicizing information, starting with syndromic surveillance, then hospital admissions, although New York City did not break down hospital admissions by type. So it was an undifferentiated, this person entered the hospital. Um, cases, there was no adjustment for severity. Testing, PCR testing, and also serology. Unfortunately, the serology sample um, that uh, the serology testing that is public uh, was a convenience sample. It was whoever wanted to come get an antibody test. And it was all different types of tests. And so there's no um, standardization or way to figure out what the sensitivity and specificity of specific tests are. Uh, we got mortality data and also geolocation and age stratification data from New York City. From the state, it was possible to get hospital admissions and important census as well. So that's the number of people on any given day in the hospital so that we could check what we were doing. Regular medical and surgical ward differentiated from ICU patients who were also differentiated from patients requiring ventilators. So that was really critical at the peak in April uh, to figure out whether or not we needed more ventilators and then cases and mortality. And some of this was actually hospital-based instead of geolocated, which has some advantages uh, for figuring out hospital load, but also disadvantages for figuring out who in what area goes to which hospital. So some of the data problems that I just wanna address in the remaining time that I have uh, include uh, most important, the, the, the difficulty that we had in figuring out the number of cases. This is a, a famous curve and a little graphic from the New York Times uh, that shows um, up to uh, uh, October 13th for illustrative purposes, the number of cases in the United States. And what you can see even with this brief sample is that there were roughly three different groupings of types of cases. A, the, the beginning, you can see that the deaths, which is the TAN, uh, really overshadow the hospitalizations. And this was from the COVID tracking project in the blue, which overshadow uh, the, the, um, the cases. And of course, these are on different scales, but I'm just using this for illustrative purposes. In contrast, at the end of the year, we saw that the green, the cases were proportionally much, much bigger than the hospitalizations and the deaths. And then in the middle, this is the C, they're all sort of in, in rough proportion. And so the question is what's right? And furthermore, how do you parameterize a model so that you can capture this wide variability in the relative amounts of these uh, three critical quantities in your model? Uh, and so I'll just illustrate that, for example, right now in New York, uh, the upper uh, left-hand graph is the case count. And you can see that it looks like uh, the, uh, the outbreak in the winter uh, was actually bigger than the outbreak in the spring. But this is almost certainly incorrect. And in fact, if you look, uh, if you click on a different tab on the same page, you can see that the hospitalizations are far greater in the spring than in the winter slash uh, early 2021 uh, wave. Uh, deaths look exactly the same. And so it, it's obvious that this first wave of cases is an undercount. And the question is, how can we really be sure of that? Well, one way to be sure is to look at syndromic surveillance. And New York City actually has one of the world's leading syndromic surveillance uh, systems that is publicly accessible through uh, a website. And you can see that the spring wave uh, counted in terms of influenza-like illness confirms that, that there was something qualitatively and quantitatively different between the spring uh, and, the, and the rest of the year. One simplistic way to adjust for this is to simply uh, take the volume of testing and, and use that as a way to adjust cases. And if you do that, you see that instead of the blue, which is the raw positive test report that I just showed, you actually get the green, which is a, an imputed um, test volume adjusted uh, number of, of cases, which actually leads to a tenfold increase in the estimated number of cases in, in early April. So oh, is, is that accurate? Is this something that we should publish? Is this something that we should use to, to change the way that people are, are representing? Probably, but but that's not enough information on which to, to really um, uh, publish this. And so what we can do is we can use other sources of information. And one that I'll show you is um, 
a, a model-based output from uh, the Como Consortium, of which I'm now a, a co-leader, uh, which is uh, available through the websites that are up at the top uh, and is open to uh, any new member who'd like to join. We have about 45 um, national groups, mostly in low and middle income countries, which is the focus of the group. Um, but using this model, you can do things like this. You can try to fit uh, the data in red and the mortality in the smooth red curve below in the United States. And what you can see clearly, uh, ignore this dark green, that's, um, that's um, actually something that's become uh, more apparent now, which is trying to assess the true unreported number of COVID deaths. And as you probably know, the IHME group has just um, doubled its estimate of the number of deaths in the United States. But focus on the, the light green. You can see that if you fit very, very closely the reported number of deaths, you have to do pretty funny things in terms of the number of cases. And so, for example, you have to go way above the spring case line in the green here up until a point in around June in order to fit the mortality line. Well, it turns out that that's just about the time when the testing in the United States reached a 5% positivity rate, which is what the WHO recommends as an adequate amount of testing to figure out what's going on in a community. This is really important for understanding clinical modeling of COVID and presumably for other diseases. If you don't adjust, and this is again for New York City, if you don't adjust the number of cases, you wind up with extremely high um, case hospitalization rates. If you adjust it, you wind up with reasonable ones. So if the unadjusted at, in, in April, when the hospitals were overwhelmed, if you would, you would imagine that 35% of all COVID cases wound up in the hospital. If you adjust the cases, it's a much more reasonable looking 5% and it's consistent after a brief blip here, which may have been a dip due to the hospitals being overcrowded. Um, and, and again, this is unpublished information, um, it, but it, it's much more consistent with the rates across the rest of the year. Getting to other data issues. So this is the New York City uh, public uh, report of um, serology, antibody positivity. And you can see that um, there, there's a, a long period of time here where uh, the rate was about 20 to 22%. Uh, positive and it goes up here and it starts off very high. It, this is very interesting, except it's not really useful in, in a model at this point because it's a convenient sample. It's not a scientific sample of the city. It's just who decided to go get an antibody test. And furthermore, we have no way of knowing what the sensitivity and specificity of the specific tests were. Now, Matt knows, because I've been emailing him, that um, a, a more formal assessment of regional serology was performed. But unfortunately, that data, even though it's about New York City, is about the New York City metro area. And so it combines outlying counties such as Nassau and Suffolk County and Westchester County. And so it's impossible, even to this day, to understand what in the five boroughs of New York City, a scientific sample of antibody positivity is. And that's really, um, I, I think, unacceptable uh, for, for um, the, the, the importance of understanding that. So here's a partial wish, uh, wish list for, for better data. One is properly standardized case data, along with a reason for testing. A second is fixed clinical criteria for death notification. So for example, uh, not someone dying from a heart attack with a positive test, but someone who actually is uh, considered to have died because of the disease in question. Hospitalization and fatality ratios over time, serology over time in cases, in case contacts, and hopefully also in the general population so that we can get a sense of the asymptomatic fraction. And then newer, but nonetheless very critical, vaccination status, including uh, people who haven't had a vaccine but may get one, uh, single vaccinees, double vaccinees, and critically, uh, the vaccine time, uh, sorry, the vaccine kind, uh, so that we can understand uh, the real world efficacy of these different vaccines, uh, which is actually much more important now in an international context with the difference between, uh, for example, the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines versus some of the other vaccines that are out there. Uh, and these hopefully all in the proper geographic scale and time frame. You know, 
I want to just close with a couple of slides. One is that um, there are multiple domains of public health emergency response. We're just talking about really one of them here, but data in all of these realms uh, are critically important. Um, and then finally, uh, I would agree with much of what Matt said. I'm, I'm a little bit cautious about the use of modeling in these emergency contexts. Uh, the focus of the Como consortium is less about prediction and more about understanding the impact of different interventions um, on what has occurred. Uh, and so I believe that modeling really uh, can, can help us with these three things. One is problem definition. There are epidemiological problems, there are policy problems, and then there are tactical problems. Uh, and the tactical is really where I spend most of my time. Then it, clarification of what's known and what's unknown about this disease and, and future diseases. And then hopefully quantification of risks and quantification of requirements. If we have this many people coming into the hospital, uh, how many beds will we need? How many staff will we need? How much oxygen will we need, for example? You know, modeling can do really great good uh, on the left, you see a vaccination program, and it can be used for, for uh, worse purposes. On, on the right, you see the famous picture of the SAR Bomba, the largest nuclear uh, explosion ever uh, committed on the, United, uh, uh, on the earth. Um, you know, wouldn't have occurred without modeling. Um, so if we wanna do good with modeling, we have to have the elements, uh, some of which Matt described and some of which I've described that are necessary to, to make it happen. We have to have the right modeling frameworks. We have to have the right data elements. We have to have the right calibration and verification and external validation uh, opportunities. And then we have to have the right fora for application and for getting the modelers in, in touch with the policymakers. Hopefully they've been in touch during the whole development of the model. Um, but, but this is also a critical element because modeling in the dark uh, doesn't really help anyone. I just wanna thank all of my um, colleagues and associates and, and medical students uh, who've participated in creating some of this and then I'll stop sharing. So, so thank, thank you, Dr. Hubert. That was um, very illuminating. So with that, you know, please uh, send your questions at the live chat or tweet at NSF underscore prepare. So with that, we go into our question answer session. And uh, some of these questions are uh, directed at the individual speakers, but, you know, feel free to, you know, chime in. So, um, so first, you know, the first question is fantastic talk, Matt. Um, what differences have you seen between forecasting something like the flu and COVID-19? And do you account for different variants? Yeah, thanks for the, the compliment. And, and I mean, the sort of uh, work to forecast uh, flu and, and COVID is a, a bit different with just one. The, the scale of the COVID forecasting is quite different than the scale uh, of flu forecasting there. We were uh, using one indicator influenza like uh, illness uh, that uh, we had at the national and state uh, level. So that was, uh, you know, much fewer targets than what we're doing with COVID, um, you know, where we have three different targets, some uh, one that goes to the county. Uh, also with uh, flu, uh, we had quite a long track record of, of surveillance, right? That system that is uh, used for forecasting flu or was used, uh, goes back to 1997. Uh, we've had multiple seasons, uh, different strains that are circulating. Uh, so it really does give modelers, a, I think, a better sense and forecasters a better sense of what is the possibility with seasonal flu. We, of course, didn't have that uh, with COVID. So there's a lot more uncertainty. The data is a lot uh, more changeable, as uh, Dr. Hubert did a really nice job of showing, uh, you know, that sort of changing ascertainment of cases over time. Uh, and then with flu, we don't really have to think about sort of the changing landscape of interventions quite so dramatically, right? We often have our vaccine program is complete. Uh, before uh, kind of flu activity really picks up. We're not, um, you know, telling people to stay at home, uh, closing workplaces, closing schools, uh, and changing those policies uh, kind of constantly. And so those uh, sorts of challenges are uh, quite uh, unique for COVID uh, and really, I think, takes a, a lot of different uh, sort of uh, approaches to really uh, capture that well. We do have uh, in flu um, multiple sort of... Um, strains. We have influenza type A, 
Uh, we have influenza type B, there are different uh, subtypes of type A. Um, and so we do have some of this sort of, uh, you know, uh, different uh, dominating strains and there are uh, sort of um, variants within flu as well that sort of escape, you know, vaccine induced immunity or natural immunity that will predominate. So that is a, 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 a phenomena we see in flu as well, but it hasn't probably been incorporated into the models quite like it has uh, been in, in uh, COVID now. And so that's probably one area that we'll probably try to uh, learn some lessons from COVID to make sure we're better prepared for these issues uh, with flu, because we were always a part of the issue, but never were sort of as a mean input in, into forecasting as they are likely uh, now being uh, integrated into many of the COVID forecasts. Excellent. So the next question is, you know, uh, as next set of questions is pertaining to data quality. I'm quite passionate about this issue. Even in a limited setting in our research, we've seen that, uh, uh, that you know, when uh, you data collection and then transformation, this process is not trivial. And so your analysis results are as good as your, you know, the data that you're analyzing. So the next question is that, you know, how do you address data quality issues? Um, carefully. <laughs> Part of this is um, our absolute reliance on uh, frontline public health partners. So, for example, if you go to the New York City GitHub site about their data, they have a nice description of how they wind up with their uh, COVID hospitalization numbers. And they talk about this four part complex process where they go to their lab and they, they look at syndromic surveillance. This is why they report double the number of hospitalizations as the, as the state, because the state doesn't have the, the ability, the depth, the experience to do this. Uh, I think this is a, you know, I, it seems to me that that's, that's the sort of example that needs to be highlighted. And of course, I'm very reticent to, to, to publicize that much because I'm not sure that the city and the state would be happy with people knowing that there's this huge gap. But that's the reason for the gap. The, gap, the, the reason is that the city finds that this is a critical topic on which it is willing to spend over the course of a year, multiple FTEs worth of of effort to make sure that, that they have the most accurate numbers possible. Um, I, I've looked across the, this, the, the country, it's rare to find a, um, a state or a city that is reporting daily hospitalizations for COVID. It's much more common to find that people are reporting back on their uh, data aggregation sites what the hospitals are saying their nighttime census is because that is something that you simply hear and then aggregate and report. Finding the individual cases is much, much more difficult. And so I think really this is one of the places where the uh, increasing and I think really necessary talk about refunding public health comes in because without robust public health infrastructure and without people who are assigned to do this, we won't have good data. It's not something that can be accomplished through cheap automation. This requires people and these people need to be trained and there needs to be continuous funding and it's an investment. And also, I, and um, Matt, would you like to add some more to that? Because a CDC is collecting data from, you know, so many autonomous hospitals and uh, uh, agencies, everyone has their own, you know, own protocol of doing things. So, I'm almost sure there's no standardization in, you know, uh, in place, you know, for, for these kinds of things. So, um, so how does C CDC deal with the data quality issues? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one way that this has sort of been helpful is, as I sort of highlighted that, that hospital data system, and that really was a way to standardize what was coming from hospitals using at least as, you know, with clear data dictionary of what's being requested, standardizing sort of the input across the country and trying to get the same information from sort of every hospital, because as, as Dr. Hubert highlighted, you know, hospitalization data prior to that was really a mix of different outcomes. Uh, some were daily admissions, some were, they said, sort of whoever was in the hospital with COVID at the time. 
And so that sort of work highlighted and, and was able to sort of at least bring some consensus to that system. And then uh, once that happened, it really made those hospital forecasts uh, a lot more actionable. So I think it was a nice um, sort of effort that, that then shows um, sort of a, a real outcome of, of why having data that's uh, you know, more standardized and the way it's captured really does make modeling um, uh, easier and, and more accurate. And that was demonstrated. Uh, I think with sort of the case and death um, uh, kind of reporting uh, systems, there are sort of case definitions, but you know, every state and jurisdiction sort of can uh, change how they're reporting either the frequency or if they're reporting probables or confirms. Uh, and then you know that also is who's getting tested gets mixed into that. So it, it makes those outcomes uh, a lot, uh, a little more difficult to, to model, but we're able to sort of at least work with partners like at uh, Johns Hopkins, who's done a great job with their dashboard. They are actually following up with uh, jurisdictions daily if they see sort of weird uh, data reporting anomalies or if the frequencies have changed to really understand uh, what has caused uh, that to happen and if they can sort of work to mitigate those issues. And then they feed that information out in real time to the forecasting community to make sure that they're sort of using the data or at least are, are aware of the issue, right? A lot of this is at least just informing the consumers of the data that, that something may have changed or may be going on. And so I think that's been at least a nice way to also work uh, with partners uh, across different um, groups to really try to make sure at least we're all understanding the data and how messy it is, um, uh, and then can account for that in modeling. And this isn't just COVID, right? We in flu, uh, you know, when we were doing real-time forecasting, there's always going to be sort of reporting uh, issues that happen or changes in surveillance systems. These are sort of real-time activities, and they never uh, are going to work perfectly every day of every season. And so. Uh, people who are working in forecasting are at least uh, often aware that these happen, but we always try to at least provide the information that can help them interpret uh, what's going on while we're and, and try to work to make sure those uh, issues don't become sort of systemic or, or permanent. Thank you. So the next question is for Nathaniel. Uh, it's great talk. Could you briefly talk about how do you make the modeling agile? that is recalculate parameters often. And since this may vary by event, how do you estimate when to refresh? Uh -huh. um, I guess my first answer to that is get funding uh, so you can hire people. Um, you know, it's uh, honestly, uh, one of the things that distinguishes a lot of the groups that are, for example, in the, the MMODs, uh, this is the multi-modeling consortium that, that Matt showed is that these are, groups that have been, uh, for the most part, funded by either NIH or NSF uh, to do mathematical modeling of infectious diseases for a while. Um, and that money is not a lot. Uh, it's been, you know, it, 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 this is a, a field that is fairly new. Uh, this is a field that is, Actually, when it comes to the intersection of infectious disease modeling and healthcare operations, there had been a, a, a US government agency in that space. It was the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, from 2000 to 2009. It had a preparedness portfolio that was not oriented towards fundamental biological modeling or engineering approaches to preparedness. It was at the intersection of those two. And in 2008, 2009, that entity decided, its leadership decided that it was no longer um, going to be in that space. And it focused on patient safety and quality and things like this. And no other federal entity entered that space. Um, and so I think it's really important for people to know that it, it is difficult for say academic institutions to generate the support that would be needed or that is needed for um, having trained professionals who can do the sort of daily updating of these models that would be expected both from public health officials, uh, political officials, and also the general public. The, the ones who do it often do it because their institutions are supporting them or because philanthropists are supporting them. And that's a pretty you know, thin 
uh, platform on which to base something that in the time of crisis, we all consider so incredibly important. So to answer the question, I, you know, these, these things really need to be updated daily or at least weekly as things change. We see that from the ensemble models changing uh, uh, pretty rapidly, um, but, but it's very difficult to do that. And so uh, there, there's, no, there's no one standard. Um, and this is why, frankly, you know, my group, the Como Consortium uh, and, and my group at, at Cornell have not been able to engage in, in some of these uh, updating heavy or updating intensive uh, ongoing activities, we chose to focus on other things that are more, uh, you know, that, that's, an, that's, a, that's an operational model. And we, we've focused more on tactical modeling um, uh, and, and also on strategic longer term modeling. You know, what, where, where, where have things been focused and what have been the, the effects of those interventions and then long-term um, you know, what, what are the pictures that are emerging about how this virus has circled the globe? So the next question follows very well, you know. So could both of you give us a little bit of insight regarding the strategic versus the tactical use of modeling in this context? I guess you... Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, people, people argue about the, the difference between operational modeling and tactical modeling. You know, I think formally from an engineer's perspective, the longest uh, outlook is a, is a strategic model. And this would be like uh, a delivery company deciding to put a hub in a city, you know, this city versus that city. It's a you know, 10 to 15 year time frame. Um, next, next on the list would be operational modeling. So how do you design the the, the warehouse in that hub, where are the, you know, the rails going to sort the packages one way or the other. And then tactical, if you think in this framework, would be the most acute. You know, on this day, this loading dock is broken. So how do you reroute the trucks to get around that particular problem? From a modeling perspective, a, a tactical model might be something like uh, we see a rise in this community in the number of cases, what should be the next non-pharmaceutical intervention that is increased? And uh, literally I was just uh, for the Como Collaborative uh, on a presentation by uh, a group in Syria and a group in Bangladesh where they talked about doing, and, and, and Kyrgyzstan as well, uh, where they talked about working very closely sort of hand in glove with the public health authorities to monitor you know, what the recommended lockdown looked like and how that, so that's a tactical model. That, that's very rare. And certainly that's not really happening to my knowledge anywhere in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, if you go up to the strategic level, I mean, one, th there, there are a couple of universal questions that come from policymakers and public health to modelers. One is, where's this curve going? Uh, and of course, that's the one, that's the big one that Matt and his whole group are trying to help answer. Um, but, but other related ones are uh, things like what resources should we have on hand? Or when is vaccination going to kick in? Uh, and these are, these are more long-term. Um, and in fact, there are sort of subsidiary questions like, well, if we want vaccination to change the course of this, how should vaccination be rolled out? That's something... That's a, you know, a model of that nature, which is actually one that I've uh, worked on with my colleagues in engineering at Cornell, um, is the type of thing that you would give to the public health policymakers even before there's a vaccine saying, this is an approach that you may wanna follow and these are the reasons that you may wanna follow. So that's one long-winded answer, sorry, Matt. <laughs> Very, very uh, informative. It's yeah. great. I was glad because we. I think we don't use the exact terminology, so I was glad to hear uh, Dr. Hubert uh, sort of explain uh, the the differences. But I, I think I also wanted to just circle back to that previous answer and sort of highlight. I do think um, there is more funding coming out of uh, CDC to sort of support uh, the academic groups and the the use of these sort of operational uh, modeling activities, and so. Uh, in flu and healthcare associated infections and HIV. And then for COVID, we've put, uh, you know, um, tens of millions of dollars out over the last um, few years in this space to really try to support groups who, who can sort of start trying to turn uh, the, the dials on these models each week and uh, to try to help uh, kind of make sure there is some funding available uh, for groups who are, who are working in sort of the applied 
uh, modeling space. So just wanted to provide a, a quick um, update there that I, I do think more money has been going out uh, and hopefully that will uh, continue in the, the future. But I think, you know, the way the CDC modeling response uh, was uh, has been organized is to really sort of um, make sure all of the, the questions that are being worked on or that, that we're involved in are sort of helping involve the operational sort of aspect. So we are, you know, making sure those forecasts are available to sort of highlight where we might be going, where we might need additional resources, uh, or what could be happening in the short term, our sort of varying uh, the sorts of intensities of NPI or vaccination coverage, how might that impact uh, the pandemic. And we've also, you know, worked on those prioritizations with vaccine on how interventions can be sort of uh, relaxed or instituted in, in congregate care or nursing home settings. So it's really a mix. I think it does sort of uh, go through those uh, different levels uh, that, that you described, um, but ours are often um, sort of, you know, if we're getting asked it, there is some sort of policy, our uh, response question uh, that, that is going to be informed by that. So that's sort of, uh, we kind of divide it into topics, uh, I guess, um, but they're all sort of at least in some timeline of, of what the response uh, needs, either very short term or there's an update to policy coming or uh, they're considering sort of different options for, for the future. So. Thank you. So the um, next question is for uh, Nathaniel. Um, so thank you for the, so for the data wish list, what's the most critical in your view to make it happen? Oh, um, possibly, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm an academic, so I, um, I like things to be hashed out. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure that someone can come up with a, an answer that would be quick. Um, but I think that um, one helpful step would be a uh, essentially a national roundtable. Uh, this is something that we actually tried to do uh, back in the, the early 2010s uh, via CDC was to try to figure out who all was doing modeling. And of course, now with COVID, everyone's doing modeling. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult, but to, to have a, um, a forum that would be set up to figure out um, in those categories of data that I, that I mentioned in that slide, what were real success stories? I mean, so for example, I would consider New York City's um, incident hospitalization counting and reporting to be a huge success story. You know, there's nothing like it. And, and it's a question whether that could be replicated in other cities in this country or in other countries. Um, in addition, I think that we need to look abroad. Uh, there are a number of countries around the world that have very, very substantially um, uh, improved reporting systems uh, over the course of this pandemic. And some, like the UK, that have done incredible work, for example, with serological testing that is uh, scientifically um, uh, supported and reproducible in terms of its methodology and also really useful in terms of its modeling. And so I think, um, you know, I know that there's um, talk afoot about one or many COVID-19 commissions at, to, to, to figure out what happened in this country and to think about how we might prepare for the next pandemic. Um, I certainly believe that one of those should focus solely on the data. And, and that would hopefully get us to the point where an academic like myself calling colleagues at a public health system um, in the early days of a pandemic to ask whether uh, we will be able to do a scientific sampled serological survey at the beginning of the pandemic to know what's going on won't be answered by, well, we don't have time for something that's academic or dealing with the response. It would be getting us to the point where that critical data element would be seen as part of the larger response because we know that it's going to be important in later stages. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. So, um, so uh, this question is again for Nathaniel. What do you regard as sufficient metadata for case reporting? Presumably categories include asymptomatic, asymptomatic contact traced surveillance. 
Are there others you would prioritize? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. Um, certainly, you know, you, you come face to face with a a, a COVID patient, uh, as as my colleagues and I have done over the past year, and each one has a different story. And the question is, how much of that story is really relevant? Um, obviously, if we're if, if a physician like myself is coming face to face with a patient, we've already excluded a huge proportion of the number of probable infected individuals. And so certainly capturing both asymptomatic, and there's a whole question about what that really means. Is it truly asymptomatic? Is it durably asymptomatic? Or is it just asymptomatic for a certain period of time? So people who have um, no known symptoms, that's one category. People who have some symptoms uh, and maybe go to their primary care doctor or would have if primary care practice had been open during the for example, the spring wave in New York City when basically no one was going anywhere except to the emergency department. Then there's the differentiation of emergency department categories seen in the emergency department and not admitted or seen and admitted. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the, the proven positive cases. And then once you even get to that point, then there's a whole spectrum of patients who immediately go to the intensive care unit and get put on a ventilator, patients who have a certain period of time before they worsen, mm -hmm. uh, patients who never worsen. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, now we know that even after hospitalization, there's a whole other category of patients of those who either do or don't have this constellation of symptoms that are being grouped under the heading of long COVID. Um, so it, 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 it sort of, it takes a village to figure out what this simple delineation means. And, and I think that we could simplify that into something as simple, you know, put it on one hand, you know, people who have no symptoms, but are infected, people who have some symptoms, but don't access the healthcare system, people who access the healthcare system, but are not admitted, people who are admitted, and then people who are critically ill. Mm -hmm. That would be a great addition, I think, in general, if we could get that known across the country. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Um, so um, the next comment is again for Nathaniel. Uh, I found your thoughts about the points of models at the top very germane. You can't learn with your mouth open is good advice. I guess that's just a comment. I yeah. guess I should close it. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, this is, you know, this came out of Jack's work uh, in, in, you know, decades of, of consulting and walking the floors of factories in upstate New York and around the world. Um, you know, the, the most important thing is to listen to the people who are actually doing the work. And this, I, I do think, I, I mentioned this before, I think that this has been substantially remedied over the last decade. But there was a period of time when the, the world of engineering um, took notice of healthcare and realized that a lot of healthcare was amenable to engineering, uh, you know, improvement. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of engineering groups came up with great solutions to problems in healthcare, except the, the, the lesion was that they hadn't gone and figured out who to talk to in healthcare before making the improvement. Uh, Martin Meltzer, who's the head of modeling and has been for, uh, you know, over a decade at, at, um, uh, in the main health economics and modeling unit at CDC always said that the modeler needs to be literally elbow to elbow with the decision maker. And I, I think that that's a really um, helpful way to think about it. Um, you know, it's, it, it, we, we have many, many things that we could say should be done. Uh, in fact, early infectious disease modeling papers, some of the famous ones about flu in the mid 2000s came out with optimal solutions of vaccinating tens of millions of people across the nation every week uh, within a week or two of the pandemic becoming apparent. They, in, inside the model, they worked really well, but outside the model, they were completely logistically impossible. So we need to make sure that we keep that that realism about the models and about the potential interventions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, the last comment is for Matt. For the data released on the CDC uh, data tracker, example, the case level data, what privacy mechanisms are used? And what are the ma main challenges in making public data sets like that, these? 
Yeah, I mean, so uh, there's never, I guess, PII uh, associated with any of those uh, cases um, sort of uh, released. And there's, a, you know, before any sort of data sets are put out, uh, works through sort of our human uh, subject to review process to make sure uh, that, that we're not inadvertently making people identifiable. I mean, that's often the delay of why some information isn't as public uh, as quickly as it can be is to make sure we're not sort of putting anyone's privacy uh, at risk by putting those uh, data sets out. Um, and, and then, I mean, one of the, it's not a challenge, but as you know, or maybe people are, aren't as aware, but the public health system in the US is uh, you know, a set of different jurisdictions that own those data. So we don't have you know, a centralized um, public health system since we're a federalist uh, country. And so states uh, are, are, have you know, a kind of sovereignty. And so when you're putting data out, you have to make sure we're sort of doing that in collaboration with our uh, partners at the state and local level and not sort of um, putting information out that either can make their lives more complicated because it maybe is painting a, a different picture than the sources that they're relying on. You know, I think as Dr. Hubert highlighted, people may use different definitions. And so you can spend a lot of time at the state sort of trying to explain the differences in your data uh, compared to CDC. Um, uh, but so you, you sort of work through those processes and, and partnerships to make sure we're all sort of working and, and talking uh, from the same playbook when things are going uh, out in that information and making sure states are sort of aware uh, of what could be going up so that they are prepared uh, to, to answer those questions. So that's, uh, it's not really, I think a, a challenge, but it's just, I think one of the most important uh, aspects of sort of getting data up on a site like uh, on CDC that could get a lot of visibility is to make sure sort of the awareness of what those data sources are, how they were collected, what they mean, if they can be used for public health uh, decision making and sort of time that there's all of that information available uh, to, to our uh, partners uh, across the country. So, so thank you. Uh, I have a few more questions. Uh, so the next uh, comment is enjoyed both talks and this question is addressed to both of you. Do you think an emergency use authorization for privacy related surveillance data would be useful? Ooh, Matt, I'll let you take that. <laughs> I'm not sure I can, I guess, speak uh, eloquently to that uh, topic uh, enough to give, I think, a coherent uh, answer. I've not um, really, I guess, thought about uh, what something like that means and, and sort of what it would uh, en enable. Um, so I, I, I might. <laughs> defer a, 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 an answer on that one. Yeah, I, you know, I guess my answer would be that there's plenty that we can do mm. to improve data before we get to a point where we're telling people that we have to jeopardize their privacy mm -hmm. in order to have a better public health outcome. Okay, thank you. So um, excellent presentation and discussion and uh, are any of you involved in the NIH RFI for CD common data elements for COVID-19 research? Uh, no, I'm not. I'm not even. Okay. I guess we should be. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, so much, both of you. Uh, the talks were great and the question answer session, you know, you um, taught us many things. So thank you once again. And, um, with that, you know, um, uh, we conclude the session. And um, I guess, you know, the um, viewers are uh, free to continue uh, typing their questions on live chat or tweet, you know, their questions. So yeah, at NSF uh, dash prepare. So with that, we end and the next session begins at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time, which is more on privacy, I would say. Yeah. Great. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be on stage with Matt, so to speak, and um, uh, for the whole PREPARE team, thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.